Good morning, or <clears throat> good afternoon, I should say. It's four minutes after 12. <laughs> I hope everyone is doing well. Those of you that I've talked to, I know are doing well. So. And uh, we have two new people who have joined us for, for just for the weekend. Is that correct? I I need to say something just to remind you all of how how important keeping silence is. Um, Out of the ten of us that uh, started Noble Silence together last night, I have uh, observed six uh, speaking unnecessarily. And that's only the ones I noticed. (laughs) So I want you to realize it is very important. And I understand that perhaps there was some... uh, Occasionally there there is some need. But I think most of you, you don't really need to speak or uh, gesture or anything else to each other. So please don't. And those of you that do, for some really, truly compelling reason... Make sure that it is out, not within range of hearing of other people. So, uh, because the the truth is, as I'm sure you've noticed, whispering is almost more disturbing than speaking out loud. So, so please, if uh, if if there's some absolute necessity, uh, you know, including involving the uh, the people who are helping to manage the retreat. Please go where no one else can hear you to say what needs to be said. Just out of consideration for everyone, please, and especially out of consideration for your own practice at the effort you're putting in. But thank you for doing that. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask you for your questions, and I want you to... Uh, Please don't hesitate to ask them. We have, as always in this group, people at uh, every level of experience and practice. And there is no one's question that is too too simple or no one's question that is too advanced that it will not be a benefit for everyone, uh, for everyone to hear it. Um, and when, uh, when listening to other people's uh, questions and the answers to them, try to learn as much as you can. Not just for your own future benefit and practice, but for the sake of being able to help other people in their practice in the future. So this is something that's been on my mind a lot lately. If we consider the state of the world that we live in and why it is the way it is and how it could be otherwise, when we look at this world we see that There is a tremendous amount of unnecessary suffering already in this present moment. And there is hugely more suffering to come. And it's coming very quickly. And and I'm speaking in terms of unnecessary suffering. Because to be born as a human being is to experience the pain of, uh, of birth, sickness, the inevitable uh, unpleasant experiences that happen at some point or another in every human life. And then to experience aging and death. These are unavoidable. There is the pain uh, associated uh, with being a human being in the world that 
no one, not even a Buddha, can uh, escape from. But there is all of the suffering that is unnecessary, far, far more than automatically comes from the fact that we are in physical bodies living in a physical realm. Bodies subject to sickness and injury and to aging and to death. And if we look at why all of this unnecessary suffering is present, we may come up with a huge long list of answers. But in the end, I think we'll see and we'll all agree that it is because of greed and aversion in one form or another that all the unnecessary suffering of the world arises. Can you agree with that? Yes. We look at the economic difficulties that uh, our societies are presently experiencing. And how did that come about? Human beings like ourselves, intelligent, knowledgeable human beings, made decisions. And they made decisions not unaware of consequences and potential consequences. But they ignored that and they made decisions based entirely on their own desires or their own fears. And we see that the climate is changing. We see that there's greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We don't know. We have no idea at all what the long-term consequences of that will be. But we can guess at some things. We know that unquestionably there's going to be a lot of destruction, death, perhaps disease, famine, all kinds of things. When climate changes and the crops that we're used to don't grow in the places we plant them anymore, people starve. And why, why is this? Why have we done this to the world? Because it is commonly accepted in our world that you have to look after yourself and your family and your own needs and then after that, the needs of your country. And it's always disregarding at the expense of whatever suffering it may cause someone else. So we have nations and industries and individuals at every level that continue to do harm to the planet because it's of immediate benefit to themselves, their families, their social group, their nation their industry, and disregarding the harmful consequences both present and future on other human beings acting out of greed. And then as, as the problems arise out of this, people react with aversion uh, to protect the same self and family and nation and so forth. We're willing to deliberately inflict harm on others. We we exploit each other all the time in many ways. And we know that there are many millions of people in this world that work for, that, that what they receive in exchange for their labor and their efforts, and often in dangerous and polluted environments, is a, a degree of reward that if we received it, we would, we would consider that it was, it was the worst possible reward we could possibly have, and yet we will fully uh, enjoy the fruits of all of those people's effort and labor. And, of course, it goes beyond that, because in order to, to protect and reward ourselves, we engage in warfare all kinds of levels of warfare. The absolutely deliberate, direct destruction of, of societies and cities and homes and of, of human beings. And this all comes from the same place, from the fact that as individuals we come into this world with an impulse 
to seek pleasure and avoid pain for ourselves. And out of that develops all of this greed and this aversion that takes on these many forms. And because coming into the world in this way and we've looked around and said, well, everybody's just like me. Uh, They want pleasure for themselves and to avoid pain for other people. Or avoid pain for themselves. Pleasure for themselves and avoid pain. Uh, And they do this at the expense of, of other people. So therefore, that becomes the norm. Our society is based on it. It's the expectation. Is that not true? That we give lip service to other values, but the bottom line is that take care of yourself, take care of the people that you care about. The social group that I belong to comes first, protect it, fulfill its needs. Let someone else do it all. Let someone else suffer. And even to the point of, let's take it away from someone else if we have to. And let's kill them to take it away from them if we have to. This situation exists because the vast majority of people don't know that there's any alternative. But we know that there is. Those of you that have come here have at least some inkling that there is an alternative. That it is possible to be happy and to be free from suffering without doing these kinds of things. Do you know what I mean? Is that not what it means? What Buddhism means? What the Buddha taught? When we say to become awakened, become enlightened, become liberated, is not to rely on external circumstances to be happy. And although pain is inevitable in life, suffering is a choice. And to know that and to understand that, then not to need to try to manipulate things in the world to avoid pain, because we can accept the pain that's inevitable without suffering because of it. That's what this is all about. It's about this for ourselves, of course, and primarily that's why people undertake a spiritual path, to be free of my own suffering, to find happiness for myself, and that's as it should be. But, and, uh, and 2,000 years ago, with the world much simpler, perhaps there wasn't such a tremendous imperative that many, many people discover this truth and be able to take advantage of it. But there is now. Where is this world going to be in another 100 years or 200 years or who knows what period of time? But where is, where are human beings and this planet going to be in the future if the world continues to function on the basis of seek my own pleasure and avoid pain for myself no matter what effect it has on anything or anyone else. If greed and self-serving attitudes continue to be the driving force with human beings, then we will come to an end. Like dinosaurs. Maybe that's what should happen. But Right now, today, and in this place, we are capable, there is the possibility of changing that. So if you master these teachings and you discover how to overcome craving in yourself and to become free from suffering for yourself, then 
if you succeed in this, you will be an example to other people around you and an inspiration and more people will take interest. And having done that, you will be in a position to teach them and guide them to do the same thing. The other thing that's very, very important about the conversations that we're going to have this week and in the future is that we have to find better and more effective ways of doing this. The future of the Dharma and of liberation is going to lie with lay people like ourselves, not monastics and monasteries. And the path to liberation has to become much more reliable, clearer, easier to understand, easier to communicate, and easier to follow than it has become. And we have to do the work of figuring out how to make that happen. Everyone's different. The methods that we use are more effective for some people than others. And many of you may know there's all kinds of different uh, systems of practice out there. Many different schools of Buddhism, many different traditions, many different methods and techniques. But the other thing that we know is that uh, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of people give up on the path before they've achieved the goal. Is that not true? Do you not know that? There are thousands and thousands millions perhaps of people in monasteries and only a small percentage of them have achieved the goal of liberation but large numbers of people need to achieve that goal of liberation and we need to find a way to make that happen so we need to find more effective ways of bringing that about and you're the ones that have to do it and I'm the one that has to help you do it that's our project that's our job Achieve your own liberation, but don't quit there. You examine how you brought it about, and you listen to other people's struggles and what works for them and what doesn't work for them. Because all of you, I really hope that you will undertake the task to become, first of all, examples, but also teachers yourself. And together we'll, you know, in the time of the Buddha, He was able to bring very large numbers of people to uh, all of the different stages of enlightenment uh, very quickly in a very short time. And uh, there's no question that as a Samasambuddha, that the historical Buddha was a very special and very remarkable being. But as he taught, And as the Dhamma in the uh, centuries immediately following his life demonstrated that this was not strictly due to any particular uh, characteristics of him as uh, as an individual or as a personality. Somehow or another, the Dhamma that we have today carries within it a lot of confusion. And it's the confusion that carries within it that makes it difficult and is why it takes a long time for people to achieve the goal and why a lot of people give up the struggle before they have uh, come to the end of the path. And that's what we have to change and that we can change. So let's begin our discussion for the day with that in mind and that in all of our discussions we're trying to understand the path clearly enough that we can succeed in it ourselves and that we can teach others more effectively. So that's all. We're just going to save the world. That's <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> so questions. What are your questions? Don't hold anything back. Every question's a good one. How's your practice going? What is your experience? Yes. 
this morning I had the first time to sit outside. Uh, I feel that the, um, the blowing of the, the breeze of the winds and uh, the, the bird songs, uh, it, it's kind of a, um, not easy to uh, make a kind of distraction for me to, to, to sense the inner uh, sensation. Mm-hmm. So if we really had to sit outside, so how to do that? <laughs> Well, those things are just distractions, and there are always distractions of one kind or another. And uh, so they're, they're really no different. We could spend all our time trying to find the perfect place to sit and practice where there is the fewest external distractions possible. And then we'd still have all of the inner distractions. Uh, what I find, and tell me if this agrees with your experience, that of the two, the outer distractions are far easier to deal with than the inner distractions. Is that not true? Yeah. So in a sense, the outer distractions give us good practice in dealing with the inner distractions. And they also help to reveal the true nature of of those distractions. Some sounds that are not as loud and not as persistent distract us more than other kinds of sounds that are are louder and more persistent. Is that not true? Can you find that? And of course, what's the difference between them? Our mind reacts more strongly to one than to the other. For example, and this may not necessarily be true of your particular, but for example, a person may find that trucks going by on the road, no bother at all. But if the dog next door starts to bark, it really bothers them. Okay? There's nothing about the sound of the truck or the sound of the dog to account for this. It's only what happens inside your mind, and it's the reaction. So. You can learn from that. You can learn about yourself from the reactions. You can see what happens. That a sound, a sound is just a sound, but then it gives rise to a concept. Concept maybe of, of the dog. There's actually no dog in the sound, but our mind puts a dog into it. And then it comes along with that, well, the dog has an owner, and the owner should probably do something about the dog, or so on. Let's see. And we see how our minds elaborate and create the reality that we're experiencing in the moment. Here I am sitting here trying to meditate. I can't concentrate because all I'm doing is feeling annoyed because of that dog that somebody should take care of, just as an example. Or you go outside to meditate and there's the sound of the birds and it's beautiful. And maybe you're sitting close enough that you can smell the... uh, smell the lilacs or one of the other flowers and, oh, that's, that's a distraction too, you know. And the sun shines on your skin and there's a cool breeze and the combination, it's just delightful. You know, the, the warmth of the sun and the coolness of the breeze together, you know. These, these are very wonderful distractions, but they're still distractions. And why are they distractions? To the extent that they're distractions, it's because of how the mind reacts to them. They can be very positive. One of the reasons that I like the walking meditation outside in a place like this, and this would be true of sitting as well, is that those kinds of distractions can put the mind into a state of joy. And a joyful state of mind is actually a very good state of of mind in which to, uh, to work and to practice. But if they trigger thought processes, and if they uh, actually take you away from the practice, then they're, they're distractions rather than uh, positive joy-creating features. But the important thing in, uh, in this is that 
yes, you want to choose the place where you can practice most effectively, but never neglect the opportunity to take advantage of what presents itself. So you may decide not to meditate outside uh, later on because you're sitting outside meditating now and you find these distractions. But the most important thing is don't think about, don't start thinking and processing. Instead, make use of the distractions in the most positive way to support your practice, to support you in understanding and, and observing what's happening in your mind and understanding why you experience it the way you do. So, what do you think of that in terms of your experience? Are you going to meditate outside again? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> but if you find... If you find other kinds of distractions wherever you are, then the proper thing to do is you can make a decision to change something, but accept what already is and don't waste your time worrying about it and work with it as well as you can. Thank you. That was, that was good. Yes? I find the opposite. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think I'm walking outside. I sort of absorb into all the very sound. Mm-hmm. Sort of quiet my mind. Because it's complete with my thought otherwise. My thought would just come up without my notice. I mm-hmm. didn't even realize things until the thought comes in. So my my thought sort of like a bird. It jumped up from yeah. nowhere. So listening to the bird actually comes quiet my mind. And that's that's very good. One of the things you'll notice about any kind of meditation that we're talking about here is that a very important part of it is coming into the present. And our thoughts take us out of the present, out of, out of where we are. They take us into the past or into the future or sometimes into some other place. And so... You know, if you're successful in continuing to observe the sensations of your breath, it means you're being present. And if you're successful in walking and observing the sensations in the soles of your feet, you're being present. If you are hearing the sounds of the birds and not thinking about it and analyzing it, you're being present. So it's all contributing to the same thing. Um, And that's what I was really... Uh, talking about that being here can create a calm, relaxed, joyful state of mind which is conducive to our practice. So the objective isn't to become relaxed and happy listening to the birds because, you know, that's very good in the moment and it does help to bring us into the present. But the reason that we want to come into the present is to be able to gain insight into the nature of reality and into the nature of our minds. So it's very good to use anything that helps us bring it into the present, not to lose sight of what the goal is and where we're trying to go with it. So, And uh, recently had some conversations with people suggesting an, an, an approach to Uh, to developing meditation skills is instead of focusing on a single object like sensations of the breath to just uh, make it your intention to stay in the present and that's a very good idea but we need skills and if your ability to stay in the present is dependent upon external circumstances, then you haven't really acquired a skill. So you can use the circumstances to advance the process, but uh, 
What we need is the mental skill to rest our attention wherever we choose with great clarity of perception and to do so as often as we want on whatever we choose for as long as we need to. And so practicing in a way that allows us to experience that but without having developed the skills uh, would be a mistake. So, for example, you can come to a very relaxed, calm state of mind um, by listening to music. And there are CDs that are sold that are called meditation CDs. And they're very mellow, pleasant music. And you can put your headphones on, lay down in a comfortable place and listen to the music and be very calm and relaxed. Will you have achieved any of the goals of meditation? What do you think? No, you would, what you'll have achieved is a facsimile of that goal. The other thing that we want to achieve in our meditation is a very high level of mindful awareness. And I need to illustrate what I mean by that. Uh, we can be very vividly and clearly aware of what we are holding in our consciousness in, in the moment. Or we can be in a very dull, sort of loose state of awareness. Right? You all know that. One extreme is where you're, you're, just, you're, you're so dull that you're actually falling asleep. There is another extreme that some of you may have experienced. Sometimes when you are in a, uh, a very dangerous situation, your mind will just shift into very high gear and you'll be extremely aware of every detail of what's going on, almost as if time slows down. It goes into slow motion. Which gives you an idea of what you're capable of. And, of course, athletes often try to enter into that state. They call it the zone. You know, so if they're playing tennis or a batter, you know, playing uh, baseball, it's into the zone so that they're totally focused, totally clear, totally sharp. It's as if everything slows down. A uh, famous basketball player, I don't remember his name, but it was a big, uh, that's because I'm not very much into sports, but I happened to hear him talking to someone on television. This was about a month ago. I was very struck by he said, he said, well, to tell you the truth, when I'm out on the court, everything goes so slowly that it's easy. That, you know, I feel like, you know, like every, everything slowed down. And that's, he was talking about being in the zone. That's, that's, that's the kind of awareness that we're capable of. And of course, we all have that at different times, too, at different degrees, when in a situation where there's a potential of uh, some great benefit to ourselves or some problem to ourselves, our mind immediately becomes very focused and very clear and very sharp. And then there's other times our mind becomes very relaxed and we're barely aware of the things that are going on. And the contrast is quite obvious. Um, When our minds are in that relaxed state, we often come to false conclusions. We don't really see, we think we see something, we see what we expect to see, and we don't see what's really there. You know what I'm talking about? So we need to develop mindful awareness. So a very important part of our meditation practice is, develop, is developing very sharp, uh, very clear mindful awareness. Um, I'm not sure exactly where I started out from on this. <laughs> Let's see, we were talking about... Uh, Music. Uh, yes, we, we were talking about things that are facsimiles of of what we're trying to uh, develop. So what we need is to have a mind 
that we can focus wherever we need and examine things with great, strong, mindful awareness. So we need to develop mindful awareness and we need to develop the ability to direct and sustain our attention. Because this is what's going to allow us to break through our ordinary, confused way of seeing things and understand the truth that is going to liberate us. So it doesn't do... Uh, it, it, it's not sufficient to reproduce by different means uh, a facsimile of what it would be like to have concentration, a facsimile of what it would be like to have a mind that is is unified and, and calm and tranquil, or a facsimile of what it would be like to have a mind that is... Uh, powerfully mindful and aware. We need to have the real thing at our disposal. I saw when you listen to music, you're passive. Your mind is pass- passively appeared. Yeah. It's passive, and, and that's what's really important. An external circumstance is bringing you to that state. Whereas what we need to do is to know how to generate tranquility internally. The other thing when we talk about <clears throat> developing these faculties of mind is unification of mind. Uh, when we experience calm and peacefulness and happiness, uh, it is because our minds are unified. And now what does this mean? Uh, you may think that your mind is one thing, but it's not. It's many different mental processes going on simultaneously. And it's, it's as though you have many different minds. Do you know what I mean? You find that in your meditation as well. You sit down and you have one mind that says, okay, we're going to concentrate on the sensations of the breath. And then some other mind comes along and says, well, I'd rather do something else. <laughs> and these two minds are in conflict with each other. And that's an oversimplification, isn't it? We really have like 16 or 17 minds uh, all trying to go in different directions. Some of them in grossly different directions, like why don't we go read a book instead? And uh, some in subtly different directions. Uh, why don't we find something that's more fun to concentrate on than the sensations of the breath? You've got all these different minds with different goals and different different directions that they're trying to go in. And that's what gives you that sensation internally of being scattered, unfocused. That's why your attention goes all over the place. There is one mind that thinks, well, I have this important thought. <clears throat> Let's think about this thought. And some other mind says, well, this hurts here in my knee. Instead, let's worry about getting the body comfortable. And some other mind has its own agenda, and so on and so forth. And they're all going at once. Is that not right? You have that experience? Yeah. That's wonderful. You might look at that and say, oh, that's a problem. That's a problem with my meditation. This is terrible. I sit down. Ah. But it's not. It's a gift. It's an opportunity. You look and say, wow, that's what's really been going on inside of me all the time. All this time that I was frustrated because I couldn't be what I wanted to be, well, it's because there's all these different things going on at once. So it's a gift. It's not It's not a problem in your meditation. It's what you're supposed to learn. It's what you're supposed to discover. It's, it's an insight. You see that. But what we achieve in our meditation gradually over time is we learn to unify our minds. So you're out there, uh, you're at work, you come home from work, you make dinner, you interact with your husband and wife, and there's all these different mental processes taking place, and they all different have their different agendas, and their jobs to do. And they're all, they're all important jobs. They're all important parts of what make you up as a person, as a whole, and meet different needs in your life. But then you go and sit down and meditate, and through the proper training of your mind, you have the ability 
to unify all of these mental processes, to unify your mind and gather it all together and say, okay, we're going to come into uh, into a state of coherency and cohesiveness and we're going to function towards all, all towards the same particular goal. That's an experience of inner calm and tranquility. It goes far beyond what you can ever do with tapes and CDs or guided meditations. Unification of mind. When your mind is unified, it is it enters into a state of joy and there is energy. And this makes sense. If you have if you have some large number of mental processes going in different directions, whatever finite amount of energy that you have in your mind is divided up and is dispersed and diffused. If you take exactly that same amount of energy and instead of this part going this way and this part going that way, it all is channeled in the same direction, what you will experience is what? It's as though there is suddenly a great increase in energy. Unification of the mind produces mental energy. It doesn't really produce it out of scratch, but it allows the energy that's present to come into being a coherent, cohesive whole. And you experience energy, calm, collectedness. You also experience joy and happiness. Uh, you, you know this from other things. You've had things that you've engaged in. Perhaps you have a hobby. When everyone else has gone away and there's nothing else for you to worry about and you sit down to do this activity, or maybe it's not a sitting down activity, maybe it's some other kind, but it doesn't matter. You become totally focused on this activity. You are so happy, right? Isn't this why we have hobbies? You know, totally, joyfully absorbed in just doing this one thing. And if you think about it, this, this, is, this happens a lot. When are you happiest? You're happiest when all the different parts of your mind are in some degree of coherence and unification. And you're most unhappy when the different parts of your mind are trying to go in opposite directions when you're divided against yourself, when you have inner conflict. You might be interested in knowing there is a psychologist who's studied this for many years and has a name for it. He calls it flow. Uh, He was interested in what makes people, what brings people into very happy states of mind. And uh, his, his name is Chiksent Mihaly, and uh, he's, uh, he's written a number of books about this. He interviewed very large numbers of people, and he found that people as surgeons were happiest when they were doing surgery because they were totally focused, there were no other distractions, and they really enjoyed their work. He found that people who did enjoy their work invariably described the same thing. Well, when I'm doing this, you know, I just... I'm just totally focused on it. There's nothing else in my mind and it makes me happier than anything else I do. Some people play golf that way. And, you know, that's... uh, doesn't matter what it is, but it tells us something about the nature of our mind. A unified mind tends to be a joyful and happy mind. And this is what we do, what we find when through the practice of meditation we succeed in uh, cultivating this skill and concentration, it leads to unification of the mind. And how do you tell when your mind is unified or when it is approaching unification? You'll begin to feel a lot of energy in both your mind and your body. And you'll feel joy and happiness in your mind and your body. And you'll also find that you are becoming very, very focused So, this gives you an idea of what we're going to when, I, when you, you look at the ten stages of meditation that I've laid out. Unification of mind. 
begins to be truly present uh, in the seventh and the eighth stages. And at that point, the meditator will experience a lot of energy sensations in their body, and they will experience the arising of joy and happiness. In terms of the ultimate goals of our practice, all of the power of the meditator's mind, they have now learned to bring the power of their mind into a kind of wholeness. And this is what is going to allow them to uh, do what's necessary to achieve awakening, to achieve enlightenment. We're not doing it for the sake of the joy and the happiness and the energy that we experience. Although those, those things in themselves are very delightful when they come, but that's not the goal. That's not the purpose. Uh, the purpose is to have a mind that we can do the work with, that we need to work, that, that we need to do. Any comments? No? How about the rest of it? Go back to your beginning. What's that? Go back to your beginning. You talk about the state, the world, and the country. Mm-hmm. And I think the problem is modern culture is to design to fragment your mind from all the news and information I, and TV. I, what has Everything. happened, yes, is that we have we have uh, allowed our society to develop in a way that, yeah, it's, what are people doing? They're seeking as much diversion as possible, scattering their mind. Multitasking is hailed as being the greatest thing that you can do. You, know? <laughs> you can eat a sandwich, read the newspaper, and watch television all at the same time. You know, it's <laughs> And maybe talk on the phone to somebody, too. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. Not only that, our society is constantly encouraging us to, you know, the, the, to have desire, to need more, to want more. You know, you only make a hundred thousand dollars a year, you can't be satisfied with that. Look at all the things you can have if you make more money. So. All the all the junk mail comes in my mailbox every day. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. But it starts with making a change in ourselves. When we make the changes in ourselves, we find, uh, we'll find the answers lie there. And then, of course, it's sharing that with as many other people as we can. So that's the new thing that I'm putting on you. Is you're not just doing this for yourself. You can't just do this for yourself. If you do, just, well, one thing, if you do it for yourself, if you're like most people, um, if you're doing it only for yourself, when it begins to be difficult, when you start to have doubts, uh, when uh, you're experiencing dissatisfaction with the degree of progress that you've made, then you'll, that can be enough to make you slack off and back away and not continue to practice. But if you keep in mind that you've got the rest of the world depending upon you, then you might be willing to keep on and persevere in spite of the, uh, in spite of the temporary difficulties that you're encountering. It can help to give you that, that uh, uh, continue that, that diligence to continue making the necessary effort. Yes? Uh, I heard from a couple of people that when they get tired, they, they go meditate. Uh, I think Scott will mean that. <laughs> he, he, when, he's, when he's tired, he just goes to meditate and then he feels invigorated. It, it has to do with the unification of the mind. Bring up the energy and joy. It has to do with bringing that energy up. Yeah. So, so maybe it's better than sleeping sometimes. Uh, well, it, there is some truth in that, but it, uh, it, it depends on the level of your meditation skills. The, if you do a lot of meditation, you'll need less sleep. Mm-hmm. 
because uh, well, it's uh, hard to say exactly why that is, but I can speculate about that. But it is something that you consistently find, and you've been on uh, retreats where you found yourself after a few days, you know, you only you need progressively less and less sleep. So uh, that's true, but. If you're if you're not yet at that level, it probably won't work. You know, if you're if you find yourself if you if you're not at that level and you find yourself tired and you decide to sit down and meditate, most likely you'll just fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so. You feel the breath in more than the breath out. Yeah. yeah. Well, <clears throat> nothing wrong with that. Uh, keep in mind that you're not really interested in feeling the breath in your whole body. If you do, that's fine. But what you, what we're really doing is using the sensation of the breath as it comes in and as it comes out as a place to rest our attention. That's its main purpose. And if you feel, if, if you feel uh, the sensations of the breath in the rest of your body, in or out, at the same time, that's fine. You know, nothing wrong with that. But the important thing is that you try to keep uh, the focus of your attention in one place. Not that you're excluding those other sensations or other thoughts or anything else. Um, as we go through these stages, in the first three stages, all you're interested in is not forgetting the breath. It doesn't matter how many other things you're aware of at the same time. It's not forgetting the sensations of the breath, not forgetting the meditation object. And of course, when you're in those stages, you are forgetting it, and your mind is wandering, and then you're remembering and bringing it back. But uh, in terms of what your goal is, your goal is to get to the point where you don't forget the breath, and you're, you're not concerned with anything else that's there. When you uh, when we get to the next series of stages, the fourth, fifth, and sixth, then we start dealing with uh, ignoring everything else and trying to be more exclusively focused on the meditation object. In this case, the sensations of the breath. So. Uh, It doesn't matter whether the in or the out breath. The in breath is more, it, it, just in terms of the uh, sensations at the tip of your nose, I think for almost all of us, the sensations of the in breath are more distinct and, and clearer than the sensations of the out breath initially. But one of the things that happens when you focus your attention on those sensations is that you'll find your mind becoming sharper and clearer, and so that the difference in the strength of the sensations themselves becomes less and less important. And it's just a place to keep returning the attention to anyway, and so it doesn't matter uh, about the inherent strength of the sensations themselves. And likewise, as we talked a little bit uh, last night, and uh, Jackie's question about, well, what if the sensations are, are, are easier to detect somewhere else? It doesn't really matter. If you're having trouble detecting them here, then you could use someplace else, you know, as a way of solving the problem. But it's not that you're looking to find the clearest possible sensation of the breath, and so I'll look all over my body until I find the one place where it's clearest. You just choose a place where the sensations are clear, and that's what you're going to use as, as the basis for developing steadiness of mind and, and the skill in directing and sustaining your attention. Okay? 
But this is this is uh, what's come up in this is a very important point. Um, when you are focused on the meditation object and you're not aware of anything else, we call that single pointedness, exclusive focus. And that is something that eventually you arrive at. But don't concern yourself with that until the time comes. While while you're still at a stage where you tend to forget what you're doing and your mind wanders, don't give the slightest concern to being single-pointed. It's not important. That comes later. And then, once you no longer forget the meditation object, even then, you don't be concerned with single-pointed. What you do is shift the emphasis to always having the meditation object as the primary focus, at the thing that, uh, to be the thing that you're paying most attention to. You're not trying to eliminate anything else. You're letting it be. But of all of the different things that you're aware of, you're making that the one that you're most aware of. Okay? So, uh, time's up. But that's an important part of the basic instruction. All right, well... Thank you very much and have an enjoyed lunch. Have a good meditation this afternoon and we'll talk again this evening.